Hello and welcome back to Dr. Logic Awkwardly Does Logic in Her Bedroom. In this video, I'm going to define for you the language of predicate logic. Now, it's a much more complicated language than propositional logic because we're able to express much more complicated things. However, it's also an extension of propositional logic, so at least some of the symbols you'll already recognize. So the job's halfway done. Let's just briefly recall what it is that we want to be able to make distinctions between. We have, first of all, the distinction between objects and properties of objects. These objects can be referred to kind of arbitrarily, so I can talk about everything or I can talk about something without naming a particular object. But I can also talk about objects via essentially their names, so I can talk about Sarah. I can also talk about logics according to the function that they are playing in a particular context. So for instance, I could also talk about the person giving this lecture or person making this video. That is a function that just happens to pick out me. In any case, these are the sorts of things that we, the sorts of ways that we talk about objects. On the properties side, we talked last time about how you can have properties that just kind of apply to single objects, so like is red or is a cat or purrs or things like that. But we also have much more complex relations between objects such as, you know, is sitting on the lap of or is the parent of or is the teacher of. Those are all examples of relations. They happen to be binary relations, but you could also have more complex ones. So we're going to first have things to talk about objects and things to talk about uh, about properties. These properties we are going to divide into relations and predicates. Though actually, in principle, they're all going to be relations. It's just that we call relations that only relate one thing predicates. It just makes it easier. It's a little bit more in keeping with how we use language. So let's bring up the whiteboard so we can get our definitions nice and explicit. So definition a quantified language. And for this, we will call it L sub Q because we don't want to use P for predicate logic because we already used it for propositional logic. And yet again, we can complain there just aren't enough letters in the alphabet. So a quantified language, LQ, consists in the following symbols. So first we have the propositional connectives that we know and love from propositional logic. Negation, disjunction, conjunction, and implication. Then we have ways to talk about objects. So first we have a set of individual variables. So this is when we talk about things without really specifying any particular ones. So these are generally going to be things at the end of the alphabet, X, Y, and Z, sometimes with superscripts or subscripts, sometimes with primes or not. Again, it kind of depends on how many variables we need in a particular context. We also will have a set of constants. So these are essentially the proper names, the things that pick out specific individual objects that don't change from kind of context to context. So here we will just kind of generically use things at the beginning of the alphabet. And then we'll also have a set of function symbols. And these are, well, in the context of writing on this whiteboard, it might be sometimes hard to tell whether something is a constant or a function symbol. Though in arbitrary cases, we will try to keep a, B, C, D, et cetera, as constants, and then functions starting with like F, G, H, because function begins with F, so kind of letters grouped in that part of the alphabet often will be used for functions. The, uh, if you're following along in the textbook, you'll see that there's actually very clear typesetting differences between variables and function symbols and constants. So variables and function symbols will be italicized, constants will be in a sans serif font. So that's just an extra visual clue to indicate which one a symbol is. Unfortunately, it's really hard to represent those typographical distinctions when writing on a whiteboard. So I will try to be explicit 
so that you can always follow along and tell whether something is a constant or a function symbol or a variable. Now, these function symbols each come with what is called an arity, which is basically some natural number. So the natural numbers are things like one, two, three, etc. And this just tells us how many things we need as the input to the function. So you might think like um, uh, math, uh, uh, the multiplication. You take two numbers in, you perform the multiplication function, and you get a number out. So multiplication is a binary function. You can have unary functions, binary functions, ternary functions, quaternary functions, etc. But the kind of general term for what airy something is, is the function's arity. Now, a lot of times you can tell the function's arity just from context. But if it's ever important for us to make it explicit, then we will do something like f with n as a superscript. So, you know, f2 is a binary function, f3 is a different ternary function. So this is another way that we can kind of expand our alphabet space by using subscripts and superscripts. So this allows us to talk about objects. Now we want to talk about properties of objects. But as I said, we're just going to kind of call all of these properties relations. So we have a set of relation symbols and these are going to always be capital letters. So P, Q, R, S, et cetera. And just like with the functions, each will come with an arity. So we can talk about one place relations, binary relations, ternary relations, n ary relations, et cetera. But we will just add kind of for kind of ease of talking about these things, we'll just add kind of a note that we call unary relations. So things that only essentially relate one thing. And so it isn't really relating because relating kind of seems to require that you have two things that the relation holds between. So we will just call unary relations predicates. So again, we can, if context makes it clear what the arity is, we won't use a superscript. But if we use a superscript, P2, a binary relation, is going to be not the same symbol as P3, a ternary relation. So this allows us to talk about properties. And then we are almost there. We have kind of the new logical bit of the language that is specific to quantifier logic, and that is the quantifiers. So we've got two of these. The upside down A is going to be the universal quantifier, and the backwards E we call the existential quantifier. Now, what precisely these mean will become clear once we define the semantics for this language. But the idea is that the upside down A is talking about everything, and the backwards E is talking about something. And then finally, because we want to make sure that we've got everything that we need, just as in propositional logic, we have the parentheses that will allow us to construct unambiguous well-formed formulas out of this language. So a couple of conventions. We won't write down the arity if it can be determined from context. If it can't be, then we will we will uh, make the arity explicit. Unary relations, we will just call predicates. Variables tend to be at the end of the alphabet, constants at the beginning, function symbols kind of towards the middle. Relations are always capitalized. Everything else is always lowercase. In any given context, though, we will make explicit what symbols are of what type. So hopefully, even though we can't represent the extra typographical bits, you still won't end up getting confused. So as I said, somewhat more complicated than propositional logic, but we will be able to say so much more with it. 
And in the next video, I will give you the uh, kind of the construction rules for creating well-formed formulas, except we can't go straight to formulas as we did with propositional logic. Instead, first, we're going to have to talk about terms because formulas are going to be built up by applying relations to terms. But you'll notice that nothing in what I said in our definition called anything a term. So that'll be the next video. And then the video after that, we will get the definition for how to form a well-formed formula in a predicate language. So I look forward to seeing you then. Cheers. I forgot something. Our language also, unless we specify otherwise, will contain a designated binary relation that will have a fixed interpretation no matter what semantics we use, and that is identity. So I'm sure all of you guys know the symbol for identity, but just in case, it is that guy, except generally drawn somewhat straighter. Goodness, whoever would have thought drawing the identity symbol would be so difficult. Anyway, just forgot to add this. It's not strictly speaking part of predicate logic. It's part of predicate logic with identity. But unless we specify otherwise, we will always be using a predicate language with identity. So postscript over. Now I've got everything that you need. Cheers. <laughs>